Hello, and welcome to the second half of Nordic Semiconductors Workshop. Beginning today, ANT adopters can start developing ANT and ANT Plus applications using Nordic's NRF 5340 SOC. My name is Daniel, and I'm here to help you get started using the new ANT wireless stack together with Nordic's NRF Connect SDK. We have a short agenda today. First, we're going to review some block diagrams that will give us a little context around the software that we are about to compile. Next, we're going to walk through the process of installing both the NRF Connect and ANT wireless SDKs. By the end of the walkthrough, we'll see an NRF 53 development kit using ANT Plus to send heart rate data to an EPICS Gen 2. And last, but not least, we'll be joined by Emma Ashton from ANT Wireless, so she can give us a step-by-step -step guide for gaining access to the ANT SDK. First up, we have the block diagram overview. The 5340 SOC is a dual core device, and once it is booted, the two cores operate independently. So for example, the network processor can wake up to receive a packet from the radio while the application processor remains in a low power idle state. When one of the processors needs to communicate with the other, it can use its interprocessor communication, IPC, peripheral to send an event to its peer. This event can also wake up the peer device if necessary, which is important when latency is a concern. In fact, the IPC peripheral contains 16 individual channels, and that makes it possible for it to be shared between multiple instances of drivers that need the ability to send and receive IPC events. The IPC peripheral itself, though, doesn't really transmit data. For data, we have a bridge that allows the network processor's memory buses to access certain parts of the application processor's buses. This allows the application processor to share a portion of its RAM with the network processor for the purpose of exchanging IPC data. In the NRF Connect SDK, we often refer to the network processor as CPU Net. Let's look at a general overview of how the new ANT stack gets compiled into a CPU Net firmware image. For our purposes, we can start by grouping all of the hardware peripherals together. The SDK makes use of the Zephyr RTOS kernel, as well as many of the drivers from the Zephyr project. I draw particular attention to the OpenAMP, the AMP is short for Asymmetric Multiprocessing Framework, because it's an example of the kind of excellent open source technology that the Zephyr project leverages. The new ANT stack uses OpenAMP as the framework for exchanging serialized IPC data. Here we have the full image. The ANT stack is distributed as a library and is quite self-contained. This MPSL block is Nordic's multi-protocol service layer, and it provides some important functionality, including an advanced scheduler that allows protocol stacks like ANT to share access to the radio peripheral. The MPSL is also self-contained, and does not call into the Zephyr kernel. Note this odd-looking interaction here in the bottom right, where the application sits between the libraries and the hardware peripherals. This is a common workaround for scenarios in the SDK, where you have interaction between two loosely coupled modules. In this case, little blobs of code are transparently added to the application, and these blobs register interrupt service routines with the kernel and then forward IRQ signals to handlers and the libraries. The application processor is commonly called CPU app. Again, we start by grouping the hardware peripherals. And we use the same kernel and drivers. But the structure is quite a bit simpler. Instead of a pre-built ant library, this is a group of source files that make the ant API available to the application. These two firmware images communicate by trading serialized commands and responses using OpenAMP's RP message protocol. And generally speaking, 
This is an example of what the SDK calls a multi-image build. Although you'll be writing code that lives on the application processor, the toolchain will automatically configure and build the image for the network processor as necessary. Now we'll dive into the installation walkthrough. Let's go ahead and get started by visiting nordicsemi.com and downloading the NRF Connect for Desktop application. We can find it quickly by searching for it up here. And it should be the top result. Now this is a cross-platform application. Today we're going to download the standard Windows version. But if you install this on Mac OS or Linux, you'll see that it looks and behaves the same pretty much everywhere. Most Nordic development kits do come with an onboard Sager J-Link debug probe. So this installer does bundle the J-Link device drivers with it. Now this J-Link installer has reasonable defaults, so you don't have to pay too close attention. Just accept the license agreement and click through. Now, whenever NRF Connect for Desktop starts up, these little applets will check for updates. It does get updated fairly regularly. So if you see an update, I usually just go ahead and take care of it. Now that the toolchain manager is updated, we can launch it. And you'll see on the right hand side here that we don't currently have any SDKs installed. We'll go ahead and install version 2.1. And when it asks where you want to install it, I usually just put it next to the C drive. Standard advice here is to keep your paths short and you must not have any spaces. Installing a particular version of the NRF Connect SDK takes a little while because we have to download a bunch of stuff. The most valuable thing that we download is a tool chain consisting of many pre-built command line tools this is essentially a zip file that contains, for example, a portable, aka install to a thumb drive version of Git. It also contains the West application, which is a major component of the Zephyr toolchain. To install the SDK, you typically start by grabbing the SDK-NRF repository. There you'll find a manifest file named west.yaml. This tells the West tool locations and version numbers of the various GitHub repositories that comprise a particular release of the SDK. We'll take a closer look at this west.yaml manifest soon. For now though, we can watch as West collects the various repositories that we need, including the Zephyr project itself. Looks like it's finished. So we can go up here and click open VS code. It will check, it sees that we don't have it. So it gives us a convenient link for us to get it. No surprises here. We just go ahead and click through the installer. We don't need to launch it just yet. Now we're going to go ahead and restart NRF Connect. It checks to see if we have Visual Studio when it starts up. So we need to reload it. And we'll head back into the Toolchain Manager. Go ahead and open VS Code again. Every time you open it, it will check to make sure you have the recommended extensions. We do not. But if we click this button down here, it will go ahead and load them for us automatically. We try to open VS Code now. It will detect that we don't have the NRF command line tools. But it gives us a nice little link here. 
So we can select our platform. This is also a very straightforward installer. There's no, nothing in particular that we need to pay attention to. Just gotta accept the license agreement, click through. Great, now we head back to the toolchain manager. Go ahead and restart it for good measure. And now if we open VS Code, it will actually work. For now, let's hop over to the actual SDK that we just installed. We can have the Toolchain Manager open it for us in Explorer. And if we navigate to the NRF directory, we can scroll down and find that west.yaml manifest file. If we take a look at this, we can see at the top, it's got places where it knows to look for code. And specifically, if we look around, we see that there's no mention of ant. But we know that support for ant is available. So the easiest way to update our manifest is just to pull the dev tag where it was added. We can do that by going to nrf connect slash sdk dash nrf and checking out the tags. Here at the top, we can see that the current tag is version 2.1.99-dev1. This is actually exactly what we're looking for. So we can come back to Toolchain Manager, open up a command prompt, work our way over to the NRF repository, and check out that specific tag. This will bring an updated version of our west.yaml manifest. So if we go back and look at that now, now we can see that the ant repository has been added as a remote at the top. And if we scroll down to the bottom, we can see the hash, so the revision of that repository that existed when this dev tag was released. Let's take a look at the SDK-ant repo by visiting github.com slash ant dash connect. This isn't a public repository, so if you're not signed into your GitHub account, or your account is not authorized, you'll see this message. I'll sign into my account so we can grab the hash from the current revision. Then we'll head back to the west.yaml and update it. Finally, we'll enable ant in the group filter list by changing the minus sign to a plus.
Now we can open a command prompt and execute a West update, which will check out this revision of the Ant SDK along with any other changes to the manifest. The Ant Wireless SDK is hosted in a private GitHub repository. To access it, we'll need to authenticate over HTTPS, which means we can use either GitHub personal access tokens or a Git client credential helper. The NRF Connect SDK doesn't have an opinion about the best way to do this because several reasonable solutions exist. However, I strongly recommend using Git Credential Manager or GCM. GCM is cross-platform, handles your credentials in a reasonable way, and makes life easier by automatically supplying them as needed. Also, it's included in the version of Git that the Toolchain Manager installed. Let's see it in action now. This version of Git is new enough to ask for a credential helper when it encounters HTTPS authentication. So we'll select manager-core. This will in turn present us with a browser login prompt, which will immediately succeed because I just logged in. However, now it seems to have stalled. I've seen this happen on Windows before. It actually spawned two credential helper dialogues. The first one did its job, but we need to find and close the second one to proceed. Fortunately, this only seems to happen once and then it works properly. Now we have the ant SDK, which we can verify by listing the directory. And of course, at this point, it behaves like any other Git repository. So we can do things like check the log. In the future, we can either update the west.yaml file with the new hashes and then perform a west update, or we can enter the ant directory and interact with the repo manually, as long as we don't remove our GitHub credentials from Windows's Credential Manager control panel, GCM will continue to provide them automatically. If we take a moment to explore the new repository, we can see that it has several sample projects. We're going to work with an Ant Plus sample, but we're not going to do it here. Instead, we'll head back to the Toolchain Manager and launch Visual Studio Code. We can use the Quick Setup to select the dev tag version of the SDK. Along with the standard 2.1 version of the toolchain. We're not going to need to change these anytime soon, so there's no point in seeing them on every startup. Click on the NRF Connect icon on the left-hand side to open the extension and then select Create a New Application. Freestanding is pretty much always the best choice for application type and the SDK and toolchain have already been selected. Application location is the directory where the application's project files will be copied. Remember, keep this path short and no spaces allowed. The NRF Connect extension automatically searches the SDK for samples. They are listed alphabetically, so we need to scroll up to Ant. We'll choose the Ant Plus HRM transmitter sample and ignore the fact that this documentation link hasn't been populated yet. Let's take a look at our new project files. Note that we now have a working copy of the original sample and it's located outside of the SDK. This kconfig file accomplishes two things. First, it creates some configuration values that are used in this particular sample. Second, it automatically selects default configuration values for our convenience. 
We don't normally edit this file directly, though. Instead, we usually start by using a GUI interface to explore our options and experiment with different values. Then, when we want to make changes that are permanent, or at least visible to Git, we make changes to the samples proj.conf file. This proj.conf file configures our application processor image. This is a multi-core project, so when we build it, it will automatically build an application for the network core as well. Recall that our network processor application is called AntRPC. We have the ability to configure the AntRPC sample here as well. Any changes that we make to this antrpc.conf config file will be automatically applied to the child image when we build our ant plus HRM sample. There's a particular config that we should modify right away. Unless we set the ant evaluation key to yes, the compiler will throw an error explaining that we don't have a valid ant license key. Click on the NRF connect icon and now it's time to build. First, we need to add a build configuration which defines the board that we're targeting. The sample currently only supports the NRA53 development kit, so there's not really anything for us to do. Note that clicking the Enable Debug Options checkbox simply adds two configs to our project that makes it easier to debug. The build is complete, but note that there are some error icons down here on the bottom left. The Zephyr build system runs tools that do things like generate kernel system call headers or parse device tree files. This mostly happens before the C toolchain is invoked. The first time we build a project, it's likely that you'll see complaints from some tool that tried to parse a file that hasn't been generated yet. However, the build did complete successfully. You can see both the application and network hex files were generated, and if you rebuild the project, you'll get a short message that says, no work to do. Great. Now we have the Ant Wireless SDK integrated into NRF Connect, and our toolchain can build a sample. Next, let's use kconfig to set a custom channel ID device number in the sample before we flash it to a development kit. Let's start by using the NRF Connect extension's kconfig menu to launch menuconfig. Now we can use the J key to bump down to the channel configuration and hit enter. If we press the question mark key, we can access a help and see that the channel ID is an unsigned 16-bit integer. Hit Escape to exit. Now press Enter, and let's change the channel ID to 12345, and press Enter again. Now press Q to save, and note that our changes are saved to a file inside the build folder. This implies that if we do a clean, or pristine, build, they will be lost. Let's revisit the channel ID value, but this time we'll use the NRF Connect extension's kconfig menu. Clicking on the Changes tab will show us all of the temporary changes that we've made to this sample's config. The two debug configs that were set for us automatically are grayed out, but if we hover, we can see that our previous channel ID was 49. Let's rebuild to pick up our new config. Now would be a great time to plug in an NRA53 development kit. This one is mine. The connected devices menu down in the bottom left will list the serial numbers of all available DKs. 
and we can bump up to the flash menu and use it to erase and flash the firmware to our board. The NRF53 DK enumerates several virtual COM ports when you plug it in, and VCOM2 is often used to stream logging data from the application processor. We can click to open it and then accept the serial port parameters at the top. Now we can see the logging information from the AMP Plus HRM transmitter sample. I'll pause the stream so you can note the location of the heart rate value. Pressing the button again will reconnect the terminal. Now I can use my Garmin Epix Gen 2 to search for a new sensor. It finds our device number 12345. And if we skip ahead to the heart rate widget, we can see the values that are being generated from the simulator. Note that we didn't have to manually supply the Ant Plus network key because it's now distributed inside the Ant SDK. Of course, we've only scratched the surface of the functionality that is available in the NRF Connect extension for Visual Studio Code. When you're ready to learn more, check out the Dev Academy in the Nordic Dev Zone. Up next, we have Emma Ashton from Ant Wireless. She's going to show you how to become an Ant Plus adopter so you can use your GitHub user account to access the new Ant Stack.